Thank you, Seth. I think you're trying to say that I'm a real dinosaur, which I <laughs> definitely admit to. <laughs> so why in the world would uh, I want to build a ball bot, a robot that bounces on a sphere? Uh, well, it, I thought it would be uh, fun and interesting, definitely a challenge for students. Uh, before that, as, as Seth mentioned, I had uh, invented a number of devices uh, for uh, fine motion manufacturing uh, that, used, that had multiple degrees of freedom with a single moving part. And then also uh, for uh, magnetic levitation haptics, uh, again, uh, six degrees of freedom with a single moving part using Lorentz levitation. Uh, for compliant assembly, vibration, isolation in space, and haptics. So in 2004, I started thinking about, well, is there a way to make a ball bot you know, that a mobile robot that is really simple. And I thought about it, and uh, it, I thought it only needs one wheel. And that wheel should be a sphere. Uh, makes some sense, I guess. So uh, I started in that direction. And a few years later, this is, this is what we got. I'll just let this play for a bit. This is our CMU ball bot a few years ago with a pair of simple arms uh, navigating down the hallway between buildings. And it's got cool music to the background, so. Uh, <laughs> so this is the inverse mouse ball drive. top of the robot, we have a uh, what we call a sensory turret. It has uh, RGBD cameras, directional microphones, and speakers, and uh, LiDAR as well. Uh, so we can look around and uh, sort of need to do that if, it's, if you're a robot. And then we had back then, uh, a couple of years ago, we had these series elastic actuator arms two degrees of freedom, so they could just do this. Not much. But you'll see we got past that point now. So, uh, yeah, so uh, like I say, I couldn't get anybody to do this, so I just decided to do it myself. So I have a basement workshop that's pretty well equipped, so uh, I just started designing and building it myself. And what you see here is the inverse mouse ball drive. There are four rollers that interact with this urethane-covered ball. It's a hollow aluminum sphere. Uh, and uh, they can put torque on the ball. And then there's a separate yaw mechanism that can rotate the body like this uh, on top. So uh, uh, the ball is, like I said, it's, it's a hollow aluminum sphere uh, with about a centimeter of uh, polyurethane uh, on, on top of that. So this inverse mouse ball drive, we call it, is uh, just the opposite of an old-fashioned computer mouse that your, your parents used to use with a ball that rolls on the desktop. The ball interacts with two rollers that are orthogonal with each other. And then uh, it controls your cursor on the screen. So this is just the reverse. The computer drives the rollers, and then that drives the ball. And as you can imagine, uh, when it's driving, let's say, in one direction, the x direction, it's slipping in the y direction, and vice versa. And so in general, though, it can, it can drive in any direction, OK? So uh, uh, we uh, uh, finally got a student uh, lassoed into this project, uh, Tom Lowers, and uh, uh, he volunteered to program it. And uh, uh, one thing that we realized right away is that the, uh, the ball is controllable by the inverse mouse ball drive, for example. But the lean angle of the robot is not controllable. So it's an example of an under-actuated system. 
And uh, uh, in this video here, we have like a $9,000 truck for commercial measuring unit up here. Uh, but uh, anyway, <laughs> so uh, uh, Tom got it to work, which was to his credit for sure. Uh, so the first uh, big challenge was, you know, can we make it just balance? Uh, so this is a, a, a later student, uh, Mike Showman, uh, and uh, so uh, we started to think about this ball bot and what, what, what's a, what are the good points? There's definitely one bad point, it can fall over and crash. But, you know, that's true of modern airplanes too. If the computer fails, we're, we're all toast. <laughs> so, so we think, thought that that could be uh, uh, achieved. But it's very different than a typical statically stable robots that you see in labs and so forth. Quite different. Uh, so uh, first of all, it can be tall enough to interact with people at eye level. This is very useful for human-robot interaction studies because uh, it can see you and look at you and do things like that at eye level. Because it has a, just a sphere for a wheel, it's omnidirectional automatically. So it's hard for it to get trapped in tight spaces because it can easily go sideways or 45 degrees or backwards and so forth. And of course, there are a number of balancing robots that have two wheels. Uh, one here at uh, Georgia Tech, Golan Krang, Krang uh, was a very interesting machine. Uh, but it has, the two wheel robots have to turn first before they move in any direction. They're not really omnidirectional. So the ball bot can have pretty high speeds and accelerations uh, with stable operations on ramps because uh, it's gravity reference. Whereas a statically stable robot has to slow down a lot if it's going on a ramp uh, and it's in danger of tipping over. Uh, if it uh, accelerates too fast. Uh, another good point is that uh, the single ball wheel uh, enables it to go easily over small transitions like between hard floor and carpet and so forth like that. Uh, whereas a statically stable robot necessarily, I think, has to have at least three wheels. And those wheels are small or else the base has to be really large. And the other thing about ball bots is we tend to put the mass heavy elements like the lead acid batteries up here at the top rather than at the bottom like a typical statically stable robot. So it's a very, very per perverse kind of robot, you might say. But it's uh, one that students uh, get a lot of kick out of and uh, they've done a lot with it. So one of the most important things, however, is it's intrinsic omnidirectional compliance. So if you push on it, it will move in the direction of the push compliantly. Uh, even if it's trying to stay in one place, then it'll tilt back toward you. Uh, or if it runs into you, it, it'll just bounce off. It runs into an object and sort of bounce off because it's omnidirectionally compliant. So uh, a few equations. Uh, it's not going to get too bad here, but, but uh, uh, the, the main variables we t have to consider are the mass of the body, m sub b, the inertia of the body, here's the center of mass, the distance of the center of mass from the center of the ball, the radius of the ball, the mass of the sphere, we call it m sub s, and the inertia of the sphere, i sub s. And uh, the state variables are theta, the direction of the ball, the, dr the, the angle of the ball as it rolls, and theta times r gives you the distance. Uh, and then phi, which is the lean angle uh, of the robot. So it's the lean angle that's under actuated, not actuated. There's no actuator there at all. So uh, if we go through the mass, Coriolis, gravity, the uh, terms of this uh, equation of motion shown here, we get an equation of motion that looks like that, where tau is the torque between the body and the ball, and zero here represents the unactuated degree of freedom here. Uh, now, you can say, well, it's just a cart and pole problem that you studied in, in, in freshman physics. Uh, it is a, an inverted pendulum, definitely. However, uh, uh, it has this torque between the body and the ball, whereas the usual cart pole problem add to, puts a force on the bottom of the pole uh, but it doesn't really put a torque on it. So that, that much is different. So uh, 
Uh, so it's, we, we have the mass, as I said before, really high on the body. Uh, so it's like balancing a broomstick. You want to have the heavy part of the broom up there. And that slows down the dynamics and makes it a little bit easier to control with the high center of gravity. So, uh, so that's how we balance. Uh, and uh, this is the balancing controller in the gray box. Uh, it's just a PID controller, proportional integral differential. Here's the ball bot system, and the state variables out here are theta, phi, theta dot, phi dot. And if we feed that back, the, the phi part, uh, and we put input zero here, then it will balance uh, in one, it would balance, but it doesn't care where it is in the world. Okay, so that's the first thing we tried to achieve, which we did successfully. If we want it to stay somewhere, you know, here spot, stay there. Uh, we feed back the position here uh, and feed that back, uh, and then we have a commanded uh, position here. And we have a PD loop here that's saturated, and now it can, it can stay uh, uh, in one place. So uh, that's the basic uh, low-level controller that we use. So, uh, uh, so this is uh, showing the ball bot just, just balancing with the balancing controllers running. Uh, and Mike is pushing it around. So even though the inverse mouse ball drive has a ton of friction in it, uh, that all goes away because of the control. I mean, so it, it, uh, it's an admit, so-called admittance system that uh, takes all that friction out because of the control. So uh, that gives you a feeling for, uh, and this, at this point, the robot weighed 65 kilograms, and I think it weighs a lot more now. So if it runs into you, uh, like at a party, <laughs> uh, uh, a robotics party, uh, there's a force between the robot and the person here. And one thing you can do is that you can, uh, you can uh, measure that force, either with a force sensor or you can infer the force from the effect on the controller. And if it's sharp and high, it means it's running into a wall or something hard. If it's running, running into a person, uh, it's uh, below some threshold here. And uh, you know, people give a little bit. They try to stand their, their ground, but uh, they give a little bit, okay. So uh, that's kind of interesting. So you can, you can actually uh, you know, make some decisions, motion planning decisions based on that. OK, so uh, we have used in, in the past a full 3D inverse dynamics model. Uh, the model we use now and have for a long time is a separate controller running in the sagittal plane and the coronal plane. So two controllers, one that's doing this and one is doing that. And it's not perfect, but it works great and it's really simple. So, uh, uh, so we have to realize that in order for the ball bot to, to move, the ball has to move, but the ball has to move in reverse. So that establishes a lean, goes forward, and now I have to stop. So when I'm going constant velocity, I'm upright, and then I have to lean back. So. So uh, that's the basic uh, strategy of moving from point to point. So here uh, we have some motions uh, by uh, Umashankar. Stop, stop. You can see for a mobile robot, it's, it's pretty speedy. It can move about two meters per second. Left, left. It can do a sharp corner. Left, left. Left, left, stop, stop. Then uh, I think there's a fast U-turn here. So at this point, we, we started to think, well, maybe, maybe ball bots can be re real, honest-to-goodness mobile robots. Uh, so uh, uh, however, we wanted stop, to do uh, more than just that. Uh, so we wanted to go from place to place, you know, navigation. So 
So uh, we, st we use LIDAR, and we also use uh, vision for navigation. Uh, and we use the ROS package of Hector Slamp for localization within that map space. So uh, if you have a map space like that, uh, you can localize with ROS Hector Slam. It's a complicated program, but it's free, and you download it. Uh, and you can use the A star algorithm to find a collision-free path. And this algorithm dates back from the 1960s. Uh, everybody uses it, some version of it. But as you can see here, uh, going from a start point to a goal point, uh, it can avoid these obstacles, these black obstacles. But uh, the problem is it's OK for a statically stable robot, but it doesn't respect the dynamics of the ball bot because as you saw in the previous video, the ball bot has to lean into the turn. Otherwise, it will definitely fall over. So uh, how do you make it do that and navigate from point to point? Uh, so uh, there's a little bit of math here that my uh, PhD student, Mike Showman, came up with. Uh, package that he wrote, DFNAV is trajectory planning with differential flatness. So again, we have the equation of motion here of the system. And he realized that uh, if you had these kind of crazy equations here, if you have a function of the state variables, these are actually all vectors here, uh, and their derivatives up to some maximum derivative, and also we're able to have another uh, uh, function which maps this function s uh, into the state variables, and you apply it an effort u that looks like that, then, and, and these exist with finite a and, and epsilon here, he, he realized that it's, it's a system that's differentially flat. So if it's differentially flat, it means you, there's a possible simplification to the dynamics that will make it uh, controllable in moving from point to point. So uh, he also made the assumption that since the tilt angle is small, so sine theta is equal to phi and cosine theta phi is equal to 1, and the equation of motion comes down to, to this, where these are the terms involving the mass of the sphere and mass of the body and all that stuff. And, uh, and then you can define s, this s, as a flat output. And in this case, it's lambda 1 times the theta d degree of freedom and lambda 2 times the phi degree of freedom, where these are just constants based on all of these numbers here. So that was a key, key breakthrough. And then uh, uh, he used a polynomial basis set uh, that minimized the crackle of the, fast, of the flat output. Uh, so uh, for a quadrotor flight, uh, people typically minimize the snap of the trajectory. So you have uh, position, velocity, acceleration, jerk, snap, crackle, and pop, right? Rice Krispies. So uh, uh, it turns out that Bobot is one degree of freedom more complicated than a quad rotor. So it, instead of minimizing the snap, we minimize the crackle. And there's some math here I'm going to skip through. but. Uh, but basically, we minimize the sum squared crackle over the entire trajectory from the starting point to the final point. And it looks something like this. Okay. So when we do that, uh, we divide the trajectory into knot points. Some of those points are uh, coincident with the A star, the points that we found in the navigation from the A star algorithm. And others we have to make uh, introduce in, into them. Thing. So if we use that whole theory uh, and we try to make the ball bot move from point to point in this simulation here, uh, you, you can see it tilts and it smoothly goes from point to point. Uh, not a problem. But it, it does some weird things like this loop. So that was a bug in the whole theory, basically. So uh, we came up with a heuristic 
to just assign that length of time that it spins between knot points uh, as a, on the basis of it being a simple second order system rather than a fourth order system. So when we do that, we change the uh, length of time between these knot points and we get a nice smooth path from point to point. So uh, uh, what this means is this polynomial that was on the previous slide is a ninth degree polynomial. So the green path is the path of the ball. The red path is the path of the center of gravity. And uh, the ball is trying to its best to follow a ninth degree polynomial on the floor. So you don't have too many things that go by ninth, ninth degree. But we have to then uh, match up the boundary condition between each segment so that there's no, no jerk, no snap. The, the crackle gets minimized. So if we do that, uh, we can uh, show this kind of schematically uh, where uh, that's the starting point of the ball bot. That's the end point of the ball bot. And then uh, the, uh, uh, we have a lot of uh, obstacles, say. So the first step we do is to expand the obstacles uh, like that uh, to take into account the lean, the possible lean of the ball bot. And also for safety factor, we don't want it to run into some, something. And you can see here in this map, uh, the uh, black space is the free space that's available for the robot to move in. So if we uh, release the robot, uh, go back to three dimensions, there's the obstacles. And uh, Ballbot uh, just smoothly uh, executes the trajectory and gets to the goal point. So if we take a look at this, the uh, the small circles are along the path. The large circles are points that the A star algorithm found. So uh, we've done this kind of thing in real life and in simulation uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. Uh, and it seems to work pretty well. So um, let's just run this once more here to see the whole the whole uh, idea of uh, making it work, uh, expand the space, and then lean into the, tur the turns to make it all the way to the goal. So on the real robot, uh, this algorithm can be recomputed in just about a millisecond, so it's very efficient. Uh, so here we see uh, going from a start point to a goal point um, uh, and detecting these obstacles and threading a, its path through the obstacles here. Uh, if Mike moves a box in the way, it, it can take this path. Uh, and, uh, and then finally, if, uh, if he blocks that, is taking this path. This green line on the floor is a, uh, a, an augmented reality construct. We have a camera mounted on the wall, and we can uh, plot anything on the floor. So this, these are just pictures off of a monitor. Uh, so it's a little bit like the yellow line of scrimmage in NFL football. The players don't see the yellow line, but we watch it on TV. We see the yellow line, so it's like that. So then this just shows uh, the uh, overhead view. Red is the LIDAR returns, and uh, blue is the expansion of the boundaries and so forth, and again, up, up here, OK. So uh, and this movie uh, shows the actual robot in the lab, uh, brings up the legs, transitioning between statically stable state and dynamically stable state automatically. Uh, and now it's, it's navigating. There's a, a LIDAR here that's seeing these uh, cardboard boxes. And uh, uh, it's, uh, I think, acceptably smooth motion. And it's also very quiet, although I don't have a soundtrack here on this video. 
uh, because it's just these rollers uh, turning in a sphere. There's no gear motors and things like that, and no backlash. So it's, it's pretty, uh, uh, it can creep up on you, basically. So, so OK. So now navigation is an essential capability. But so we have a robot that can balance. It can go from point to point, but it can also navigate through a space. So it's seeming like it's going to be a real mobile robot. But can it do anything useful? That's, that's where we are now. Uh, can it do anything useful? So one thing we thought it could do is uh, help a, perhaps an elderly or sight impaired person uh, make their way through a building uh, by holding on to the arm, uh, an arm. Uh, and uh, uh, this is just a simple like, expression. It tells you the force depending on all of these variables uh, here. Uh, and uh, so we tried this in, in, uh, in spades. In Dalian, China, we took the ball bot and we put it in a belly of a 747 freighter. <laughs> we hauled it all the way to the World Economic Forum in Dalian, where we demonstrated it for uh, 190 different countries for three solid days. It didn't fall over, by the way. Uh, but I almost fell over <laughs> because I had uh, knee surgery, in fact, knee replacement surgery, five weeks before we went to Dalian. And I was on painkillers and Advil and <laughs> Tylenol and any, anything it could put in me. Uh, and the demo that we had was Ballbot leading me around these different obstacles there uh, without running into the obstacle. And I impressed the uh, audience by saying that this, this cane is not really just a prop. I really need this, guys. <laughs> so it was a lot of fun. We had people from all kinds of countries and all kinds of headdresses and gowns and all this weird stuff. It's pretty neat. A lot of fun. So, uh, so we have done uh, uh, quite a few experiments now on leading people. Uh, this is one example. Uh, we, uh, uh, in one, one example, we uh, had a, uh, a student, blindfolded student being led by the ball bot, and they holding onto the arm, and the arm uh, is nudging the person to, so the person will not run into the side of a door or something, you know, on the way out through a door, something like that. So, uh, uh, and he was blindfolded. And then we also used, in, in addition to nudging by the arm, we used speech dialogue uh, between the robot and the, and the person to tell the person OK, we're about ready to go through a door, you know, be careful, or whatever, that kind of thing. So we think that physical leading of elderly or um, sight-impaired people might be a possible application of ball bots. But you know, this is just a research platform. We're not really into uh, clinical studies or anything like that, although we would like to move in that direction. So the other thing we uh, uh, looked at was a sit-to-stand assistant. So uh, we knew the ball bot could exert a large force simply by leaning its body, uh, which traditional robots generally don't lean. Well, they could, I guess. But So we had a, a student lifting another student out of a chair using a force gauge here. And we observed the scene with a Kinect 3D, Microsoft Kinect 3D camera, so we could get the pose uh, Open, open pose, open eye, eye something like that. So, uh, and you can see in four different uh, phases of the standing motion, the green, the red, the blue, and the purple. Uh, and then the force that we got uh, out of many, many trials, sort of average, is shown here, the green position. Uh, maximum force is just a little bit beyond the, the red pose here. And then the force goes back down and looks like that. So the maximum force is about 120 newtons in general. Uh, but it, of course, depends on the mass of the person and so forth. And this operation uh, is a source of back injury for many caregivers. So we thought, well, uh, if, if Balbot could do this, that might be, that might be good. So, so here's a little video of uh, Balbot leaning, helping uh, Mike up out of a chair. 
in the sit to stand maneuver. And uh, now, if he uh, should decide to uh, halfway through to decide to sit down, uh, the ball bot will reverse the, the, the force profile. So, so it's basically an impedance. Uh, 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 controller that tracks the shoulder position. Uh, so um, we think that's a viable thing to do. So uh, Ballbot can exert the forces up to 120 newtons, but it's, uh, uh, and that is com comparable to that of a human caregiver, for sure. So here's another uh, possible application for Ballbots, uh, carrying uh, heavy or bulky loads from place to place. Uh, it's omnidirectional. In this case, uh, the human is leading the robot. Um, and uh, I think the next thing we'll see here is uh, the robot moving backward, leading the human, maybe. So we'll see. Yeah, so it's moving backwards now. And it doesn't really care which way. Now it's moving sideways. And all of this can be pretty. Uh, uh, pretty interesting uh, to do. So uh, in general, we would want the goal position or goal configuration of the load to be shared by the robot and the person uh, in some way. And that's a kind of a complicated issue of human-robot interaction, physical human-robot interaction, basically. So uh, we've done experiments with uh, lifting of heavy payloads. So, uh, Moving on to minus 90. So this is a known payload of two kilograms. Uh, and uh, that's no big deal Moving because you just, you just lean to kind of like the, the weight. But here we're uh, handing over oh, a 10 kilogram load, which is a lot of weight. It's 22 pounds to the person. And uh, while the robot's the around. Is and, uh, and then. Uh, uh, there, you can see the actual person's leaning back like you would if you were holding the 22-pound load, and uh, give the uh, payload to the Object robot. Detected. And uh, the series of elastic arms uh, you know, essentially measure the force, and I think, I think you can maybe hear it say that. Estimated weight of 9.5 kilograms to 10 kilograms. Or something. It, it, it's, it's very handy to have it be able to speak, so you kind of know what it will do. So here's transporting uh, 10 kilograms between two locations. Uh, now the robot Going actually uh, will uh, lift up to uh, 20, 21 kilograms by using its body position with our new arms, which I'll introduce in a moment. Um, so here we're uh, rotating using the yaw degree of freedom. Uh, but if we rotate too fast with this extended mass, the ball will slip Same with the floor. Down. We don't want that to happen. So we're going rather slowly here. But I think you can say proof of concept, at least. Uh, it can pick up a pretty heavy load and position it. Or so, so, okay. So, um, so we took the simple arms off the ball bot, and we wanted to create a whole new platform for mobile manipulation based on ball bot. So uh, we searched over and over for commercial seven degree of freedom robot arms that we could just buy and attach to the robot. Okay, that seems like it. we couldn't find anything that was was satisfactory. So my student, Roberto Shu designed the seven degree of freedom arms from scratch. They're hollow. They have force torque sensors and IMUs and encoders of various kinds in each joint. And then they have Barrett hands at the end, uh, three-fingered Barrett hands. So uh, we think, uh, to the best of our knowledge, this is the first robot of its kind that has uh, these arms and balances on a ball. So that must be. That's kind of neat. Uh, so it's just a research platform, but uh, we think many lessons can be learned, especially how do you control all these degrees of freedom. 
is a really, and how do you intelligently motion plan for something like this? So uh, here we see the uh, actual robot balancing. Uh, and uh, uh, we're attempting at this point to keep the center of mass in a given location. And that requires moving the ball a little bit, of course. Uh, and my student explored uh, centroidal dynamics formalism, which is used for human life sometimes, uh, for doing whole body control of the robot. Uh, that works pretty well in a simulation using Python, uh, PyBullet. Uh, but so far, it doesn't work that well on the real robot. There's a significant amount of un unmodeled things happening in the robot itself. So, uh, but we've been able to uh, achieve uh, a few things. Uh, the project is underway with three students now. Uh, we uh, uh, hope to converge on a method that probably will you treat the, uh, the uh, arm motion as a disturbance, not a disturbance, but as a sort of a feed-forward term for the balancing controller. Uh, the goal at this point in the project is to uh, perceive and interact with affordances in the environment, like the edges of tables, handles, like handles on uh, manual wheelchairs or carts, things like that, be able to actually see these things, reach out and grab onto them, and then uh, apply meaningful forces and torques to those affordances to be able to do some tasks. Uh, so we want to really interact forcefully with the environment by leaning, like opening a heavy door, for example, thing like that. Uh, so uh, this little video is kind of cute. Roberto has a wine glass here. and. Uh, He's moving the ball rod around while the ball rod is attempting to keep the wine glass fixed in the lab frame. Uh, and okay, the wine splashes around a little bit, but uh, you know it's not uh, not too bad, huh? Uh, that makes me thirsty just watching that. So uh, and you. You can kick it around. <laughs> We're fond of kicking ball balls. So, uh, so, so, okay. So this is ongoing work. Uh, meanwhile, our research took us in a completely different direction. We wondered: Can the electromechanical inverse mass ball drive system can it be totally eliminated? Uh, thereby eliminating nearly all the mechanics from the robot. So that's what we did. Uh, we invented the first spherical induction motor that's capable of uh, arbitrary rotation in any direction over in any number of uh, degrees of motion. And uh, here it is uh, on the workbench. Uh, so what we have here is six stators here. The six stators are, are skewed with respect to the vertical a little bit. That is necessary in order to produce yaw motion. You'll see here, that's the yaw motion. Uh, and uh, each of these six uh, stators generates a traveling magnetic wave in the ball. The ball is a hollow iron sphere, not aluminum, it's iron. Uh, but it has a copper layer on top of it, uh, which generates uh, currents that react to the traveling waves. Uh, so, uh, and then we use three optical mice distributed around here from gaming mice to track scratches on the ball. And this is controllable in torque, in velocity, and in position. Uh, so, uh, and we were able to patent that uh, recently. Uh, so, um, uh, we, uh, Decided to build a robot based on this, so we called it SimBot, getting rid of the mechanics. In this paper, we present SimBot, a mobile robot with only two moving parts. SimBot uses a spherical induction motor to actuate a single spherical wheel. This wheel is used to balance and locomote the robot. SimBot belongs to a class of robots known as BallBots, 
Tall, slender robots with a single ball wheel. Ballbots have many advantages over traditional multi-wheeled robots, such as tall, slender aspect ratio and physical compliance. When Simbot is pushed or collides with a person, very small interaction forces can move the robot out of the way. Using odometry from three optical mouse sensors on the ball, Simbot can also station keep. This means that unlike the pure balancing case, Simbot will return to a position after being pushed. Note that like other ball bots, Simbot is still physically compliant in this modality. Unlike all previous ball bots, Simbot is very simple mechanically. Instead of using multiple pulleys, motors, and gearboxes, or complex omniwheels, Simbot only has two moving parts, body and ball. In addition to using two axes of the spherical induction motor to balance, Simbot can also yaw about its vertical axis. This capability, as seen here, demonstrates all three axes of continuous rotation in a single motor. We've also demonstrated the ability for Simbot to autonomously locomote, executing point-to-point -point motions, as seen here. So, the downside of, of uh, Simbot is that it takes about two times the amount of power that the mechanical version takes. I think we could make it better. We could redesign the motor. We could also redesign the strategy for balancing and moving. And it could get close to the mechanical. Uh, but uh, in trying to get attention from National Science Foundation for that, basically they consider that as sort of just engineering. And it's not the National Engineering Foundation. So, so, uh, so that's temporarily on hold right now. So meanwhile, uh, uh, here is a video showing uh, uh, how fast it can go. And it can go about 2 meters per second, where a ball bot actually can go 2.2 meters per second, which is pretty impressive uh, when it's coming toward you. Uh, and uh, I think the limitation on speed here is the optical mice can't track any faster than, than that. Uh, on the ball, uh, even the laser gaming mice. Uh, so <laughs> here we're trying to see if we can resist pictures of what we saw on the ball. It's, it's pretty hefty. <laughs> oh, that was it. That was too much. That was too much. That was too much. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's very uh, comparable to that of ball rod in terms of robustness to pushes and stuff. It's pretty hefty. So, so, all right. Oh, that was it. So now I'm going to switch gears again <laughs> uh, and uh, talk about Schmoobots. So uh, in 1948, Al Cap had this cartoon, uh, and little Abner, who's here, it was called Dog Patch, I think, that cartoon. Uh, he wandered into this far off valley and he found these creatures called schmoos here. And a couple of them followed him back home and he found out soon that they, they laid eggs, they produced butter and milk. They were fantastic uh, things, and, but they reproduced like crazy. They, were, they became extremely ubiquitous and prolific, uh, which is what I want to do with my schmoobot. So I'm developing these smaller ball bots that I want to give away for free, basically. Open source hardware, open source software uh, that when we're done with, will look a little bit like the schmoo. Uh, so that's why we call them schmoo bots. So uh, here's a little <laughs> video of three of yeah, the schmoo bots. Yeah, uh, this is the world record of schmoo bots right now. <laughs> They're just being controlled by uh, game controllers. Or uh, but uh, uh, you can kind of see they're, they're able to move around and, and do stuff. So. Please remember which one you're controlling. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and uh, if I switch to the next slide here, uh, we envision these things for education, retail, and possibly elder care applications. Uh, so we want to do uh, low-cost ball bots. Uh, they have to be low-cost uh, to um, do research in controls, motion planning, and human-robot interaction. 
So we've used these already. This is my master's student that graduated two years ago, uh, Shrius. Uh, he took, took them into grocery store environment. Uh, and uh, we have a camera here, RGBD camera. We have an Echo Dot uh, device from Amazon. And uh, uh, you know, he can say, uh, Shmoo, uh, I need some ketchup, or, or something like that. Natural language, basically. It's a semi-natural language. And it says, OK, follow me. Goes down the aisle to the ketchup place. And on the way there, he says, by the way, we have a two-for-one sale on mustard today. No. Anyway, Amazon got pretty thrilled by, by that. So that was kind of interesting. So on the right-hand side, we uh, see uh, uh, the Shmoobot relative to the size of the Ballbot here. Uh, this was, again, with the simple arms. So, uh, And we've also done what we call go, look, and tell experiments. So uh, here, uh, uh, the, sound, the sound and video is really crappy here. But uh, uh, the Balbot is uh, balancing in the lab, and he's telling it, go to the office, look what's in the, on the table in the office, and come back to the lab and tell me what you saw. So uh, let's see if this will work. Uh, go to the office, look what's on the table, go to the lab. Got it. The 3D map of it. Going along here, over to the office. Looking at what's on the table, coming back to the Shmoo, what have you seen? I have seen one box, one chair, one mouse. Seen one box, one chair, one mouse. So we're using just YOLO V2 in this case, but. For the first time, we're creating a system that has this agile mobility in addition to having speech interaction and vision, uh, which is kind of cool, I think, but maybe not. Uh, so uh, this is the existing shmoo. Uh, here's the inverse mass ball drive. There's the yaw mechanism here. At this point, we have two uh, uh, Intel cameras for a visual slam. Above that, we have a pair of uh, NVIDIA Jetson uh, uh, computers, each with 128 cores. We use a VectorNav VN100 for the IMU, which is terribly expensive, $800. We need a really cheaper one. Uh, and then there's a power distribution box. Lead acid batteries at the top will probably switch to uh, LiPo. Above that is a foam thing in case it falls over. <laughs> Uh, keeps it from getting broken. Uh, the Echo Dot and an RGBD camera up here. Uh, so what we're working toward right now, pretty frantically, is making a body like this out of polycarbonate, translucent polycarbonate. We'll have LEDs drips inside that cause the, uh, so we can actually change the color of the robot at will. Uh, with the computer. So, so if we have multiple robots, we can tell them apart by color, you know, RGB and so forth, or use it for signaling purposes for HRI applications. So uh, here's the three uh, tripod uh, legs here. Up at the top, we'll have a pan tilt uh, arrangement. And in the back, uh, what we're working on is uh, a mechanism that comes out of the body. There'll be some doors that open comes out of the body and plugs into an ordinary wall outlet, which we'll sense uh, opt uh, visually. So uh, we want to be able to create a system that can be deployed for long periods of time, maybe weeks at a time, uh, without the need to have a base station. So as it's wandering around, navigating around a large space, it'll make note of where the outlets are, like these out here, back here and remember where they are, and then come in and uh, plug in and recharge. It's already got our charger back here in the back uh, on board. So that's what we're working toward. Uh, and uh, we think uh, one application might be guiding a person through, the, through a building, uh, through a shopping area. Uh, sometimes uh, when I'm at uh, Home Depot, I'd love to 
ask somebody where this widget is, <laughs> you know. So uh, theoretically, it could uh, take you there and, and get it for you. Uh, another application we've uh, looked at is in an elder care setting where the people there are uh, usually not very mobile. They may be in a large commons area, seated or in, in wheelchairs, things like that. And they're not going to get up and go say hi to anybody. Uh, they suffer from a lot of social isolation, basically. But we think that uh, it might be possible for, uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, with uh, a shmoo that was wandering around that area, it could recognize uh, residents' uh, faces, uh, and greet, you know, come up, say, "Hi, Seth. Are you having trouble uh, keeping things on the table? Uh, <laughs> have a nice day." Uh, and uh, maybe uh, the residents could uh, uh, give a message to the robot. The robot could go across the room, give it, get, deliver that message to somebody else, or if the other person isn't there, it could look around for him for a while and come back and say, sorry, he's, she's not there, or something like that. So uh, the point of that would be to try to evaluate how such a mobile robot that's dynamically stable uh, would interact with the residents, and what would they hate about it, number one, and then what they, what they may maybe like about it. And then if it could do X, what would X be? <laughs> what would you really want a robot to do for you? And we were, we're hoping that we can get a lot of uh, uh, data from these interactions. But the robot has to be operating over a fairly lengthy time period. So the ability to uh, uh, plug into wall outlets and recharge at will uh, is seen as an essential capability for that. So, uh, so I'm going to wrap it up here. Uh, we talked about three different ball, ball bots. Uh, the CMU Ballbot Mobile Manipulator, which is ongoing right now with three students and funding. Uh, Simbot, which is on hold, uh, probably forever. And Shmoobot, which we're working aggressively to make into something more real uh, with the body and, and all of that. So it's been really fun. Uh, these are all the people who have worked on these systems, uh, designated by faculty, student, two kinds of students, and other people, visitors from other countries, and so forth, like that. And uh, I say it's been really fun, but not always. Sometimes it hasn't been so fun. So uh, here's all that. <laughs> so, yeah, this happens, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Stuff happens. Uh, so, uh, this was, only took three months to debug. Uh, you know, we looked at all the balancing alg algorithms and the IMU and all that. But what the, the problem was, there was a one little micro switch down here at the bottom of one of the legs. It was shorting out and causing the power to the balancing computer to, to fail. That was three months. So, <laughs> so you know how it is when you work with real machines, uh, which you do a lot here. Uh, you have to be prepared for lots of time and effort going by. So uh, with that, I will uh, I'll quit. And uh, if you have any questions, speak up. Yeah. Well, it was driven. It's the same height as me. I can look at it in eye level. Recall that I didn't get anybody to do anything, so I had to build it myself. And I just decided to make it my height. So. <laughs> but yes, it would be driven by the use case, of course. And uh, it's just a laboratory platform. It's not ready for prime time yet. But I think ball butts could be made that could be made of sleek plastic you know, and multifunctional and really cool for working with people, maybe in their homes. Yeah.
uh, yeah, this is sort of physical human-robot interaction, essentially. But yeah, letting go of the robot at the wrong time might not be good, and so forth. Uh, I think f for the small, less lethal size uh, volbots, the shmoobots, I think HRI studies are uh, definitely uh, a good area. Uh, and I hope to make lots of these, like lots of schmooze, and uh, essentially give them away. That requires some funding and so forth. So, so uh, 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 also at CMU, we have a lot of people working in HRI. And even I've worked somewhat in HRI. Uh, we've done studies with the full-size ball about coming up rapidly to a person to see how freaked out they are, people that have never seen it before. Turns out they're not, not real freak, freaked out. They don't realize it could kill them <laughs> if it went out of control. Uh, so we've done some studies like that uh, that are published. Uh, but I think HRI is a, is a big area, a very important area. Uh, up here? Uh, speaking of the HRI pass, when you uh, like made those new seven degrees of freedom arms, yeah, Roberto did. Yeah, we were, we, we, again, we want it to be able to uh, lift a heavy payload. And th those arms can lift 22, I think it is, kilograms, just like that. Uh, so that's, that's one thing. Uh, the actuators are quite powerful. But the arms had to be also light. And if you plot the available arms space, uh, they, uh, this, Roberto's arms are way up there in, in performance versus mass. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, we want to be able to, uh, using cameras on the turret at the top, be able to see things, that, to manipulate things. You know, like grab on the edge of a table with one arm while using the other arm to do some precision task uh, that doesn't require like constant balancing. Because it, when it's balancing and doing nothing else, it's moving a few centimeters at the end point. Uh, we also have cameras on the wrist to do uh, sort of visual servoing to grab on to things. Uh, we do want to do uh, pushing a manual wheelchair up a ramp uh, with a person in it, <laughs> that kind of task. Uh, so, so yeah, the, the arms are designed with a lot of range of tasks like that in mind. And we're just, you know, we can, like I say, we can reach a point in space now by moving the ball and the arms. Uh, but we so far can't really grab something and apply force to it yet. Uh, we're still working on that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'm more concerned about the lift. Like at some places I saw that the robot is moving on the mat, and at some places it was directly on the floor. So uh, and how are you planning on targeting? How are you targeting those lift conditions? And if in case you are then in case the robot goes on some inclination. Yeah, so the question is uh, regarding uh, slip between the ball and the floor, as I understand it, more or less. Yeah, so the SIMBOT, the one with the spherical induction motor, we had operate on a mat, on a foam mat, because uh, we didn't want to damage the ball. Later, we took that away, and it operates fine on a vinyl floor. But uh, so the videos you see, they're there. The, uh, the mechanical ball bot, uh runs fine on concrete over steel grates, in and out of elevators, uh, out, outside on the asphalt, sideways, sidewalks. Uh, and we took it to, we took a, one of the Schmoobots to a Lowe's home improvement store where they were uh, selling the concrete bags and, and uh, wallboard stuff. So the whole floor is covered with crap. And we just drove it back and forth until the ball was just totally dirty. And uh, nothing slips. It doesn't slip with the floor. It doesn't slip with the rollers. Uh, after, but it requires the rollers to be pretty forcefully interpenetrating the ball to do that. And I had a whole master's student do nothing but study the, how the inverse mass ball works. So. Uh, but, so it, and, but one thing, that if, you, if you hit a pool of water, it's just like you and if you, if you slip on water in the restroom, the, your, your foot, your sole of your foot is made out of the same stuff, polyurethane, and you're going to slip. 
So water is not good for, for ball luck. Thank you.